Welcome to the launch of the report, Check-In, Increasing Access to the Formal Financial System, which explores obstacles to financial inclusion and gives recommendations for achieving an enabling environment for households and businesses to benefit from inclusion. With funding from the European Union under the project, civil society organizations as actors of governance and development, this report is the sixth published report out of nine. I am Nicole Walker, Director of Programs at Capri, a think tank keen on evidence-informed research on topics relevant to development to enable better public policy making in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Dr. Damian King, Capri's Executive Director, will present the findings of the report. A panel discussion will follow with the Honorable Brian Winter, OJCD, former Governor of the Bank of Jamaica, Ms. Arlene Williams, Vice President, First Global Bank, and the lead researcher, Ms. Monique Graham. Dr. Diana Thorburn, Director of Research, will moderate the discussion. Let's welcome Anisito Rodriguez Ruiz, the Head of Cooperation for the EU Delegation, who will give greetings. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Walker. Uh, Dr. Damien King, Executive Director of the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, Honorable Brian Winter, uh, former government of Bank of Jamaica. Uh, Mrs. Arlen Williams, Vice President, Personal and Business Banking at First Global Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening to, to everybody. I, I'm really very glad to have the opportunity to welcome you to the presentation and panel discussion of this sixth report prepared by Capri with the European Union financial support within the project civil society organizations as actors of governance and development. As for previous reports, the selected topic is very interesting and relevant and I'm convinced it will contribute to raise and enrich the public discussion around financial inclusion. The European Union support to civil society organizations and academia aims to enable them to participate more actively in dialogue with national and local actors, stimulating public debate and representing and voicing the concerns of people in vulnerable and marginalized situations and contribute as well to combating inequalities in all partner countries. Over the last few decades, access to basic financial services has become a necessary precondition for participating fully in the economic and social life of a modern society. In Europe, it is stated also as a right under the European pillar of social rights, an initiative launched by the European Commission that summarizes its 20 guiding principles, the pathway to a strong social Europe that is fair, inclusive and full of opportunities. Financial inclusion is also positioned prominently as an enable to the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals Agenda, where it is featured as a target in eight of the 17 goals. For those without access to basic financial services, life is more difficult. If they are unbanked, there is a high likelihood they are living on the edge of poverty, exclusion and vulnerability. If they are already poor, they may become poorer. They will pay more for goods and services. They are more likely to suffer from financial crisis and will find it harder to recover from them. However, financial exclusion remains a massive problem in Europe as in Jamaica. Vulnerable groups of people who lack the financial means, documentation, or the social, physical, mental, or cultural capabilities to access financial goods are most at risk of exclusion. Financial inclusion impacts also directly in the capacity of micro, small, and medium enterprises to contribute to economy and development of Jamaica. Technology has a huge role to play. Digital payments, such as over a mobile phone or using the internet, paying utilities or fees directly from accounts, can drive financial inclusion. The European Union is already committed in its new cooperation programming period for 2021-2027 to support Jamaica digitalization process and integrating digital pedagogy in the curricula of teacher of schools and training institutions. 
Therefore, we welcome this new CAPRI report. It can help us to analyze the root causes, understand the different aspects of the problem, and the role played by each of the stakeholders, as well as the strategies likely to remove the main barriers and provide workable policy recommendations. Now it's time to leave the floor to the researchers and panelists, and I look forward to hearing the findings and the discussion that will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aniceto. I am Diana Thorburn, Capri's Director of Research, and I am delighted that this is the way we're starting off the year. Very happy and excited about this report and looking forward to the presentation that's about to follow with our Executive Director, Dr. Damian King. Before we get to him, we are going to be taking questions tonight from you, our audience online. Welcome on Slido. Uh, those of you who don't know Slido, simply go on any browser to slido.com and enter the code Capri. Very easy. When you get there, please go to the poll question first and uh, answer the first poll question, which is how many accounts do you have in a financial institution? I'm going to hand over to Damian King, who is going to present the report and the findings. Damian. Half of those who are employed and have bank accounts do not get payment electronically. They get either cash or a check. That is what financial inclusion is about and why it is so important. So what is financial inclusion? It is access to financial products and services, but there are three, four key functionalities that are critical to financial inclusion. One is payments. Are payments made by cash, by physically traveling to a location and handing cash to somebody? Or is it done electronically from where you are, either by you know, a mobile device or a payment card? Savings. Do you keep your savings in a financial institution or are they in a top drawer in your house? Are you, do you have access to loans? Are you able to get a loan to tide you over when circumstances call for it? Or you need to buy a car, and a car is going to pay for itself over the course of time, but you need to borrow the money first. Do you have that option? And what happens when a catastrophe strikes, somebody gets ill? Do you have insurance to cover that unexpected expense? That is what financial inclusion is about. And what is the extent to which you have access to those services? You may have an account and have a debit card, you know, that covers savings and payments, but you don't have the ability to easily borrow money when you need it, and you don't have insurance. So you can be partially financially included or included to, for some kinds of payments, but not others. So that's the landscape that we want to explore. And this is an important discussion because having access to financial services is important, first of all, individually. It's important for when you have to pay a bill, do you have to get on a bus and travel to a location and stand in a line? And by the time you get back home, you have used up one or two hours. Our survey that we did for this report revealed that somebody who's at the minimum wage level on average takes two hours to cash a check. If you are financially included, you get paid electronically, you make your payments electronically, that's two hours that you save every, time, every payday. Your standard of living is also tied to whether you have access to financial services or not. Because if you don't, then your daily standard of living is connected to your cash flow. You actually have to have cash for any kind of purchases you need on a given day. Financial services helps you to mitigate shocks. And all of our lives have unexpected developments. But apart from the importance of access to the financial sector to individuals and households, it's important on a macroeconomic level as well, because 
All of this speaks to the efficiency with which economic activity is carried out. And so therefore, it affects the overall productivity of the economy. The financial sector is critical in the economy, and the more persons that have access to the financial sector and the more small businesses, is the more productive an economy is. Where are we in Jamaica when it comes on to access to financial services? Cash is still the dominant means of payment. Our survey revealed that three quarters of persons we spoke to expressed a preference for cash. Consider though, that this is in the context of not having good and easy alternatives to cash. When we tried to find out if everybody had access to some kind of account, it turns out that 17% of the population do not have any account in any kind of financial institution. Access to credit. Have you accessed any kind of borrowing, even on a credit card, over the last six months? Turns out that only 13% of the adult population had access to credit in this way over the last six months. A particular problem for micro, small, and, uh, and medium-sized businesses, because every business needs to have credit in order to you know, use working capital, in order to manage its cash flows. For micro, small, and medium-sized businesses, only 25% of those businesses were carrying any kind of debt. So that is one of the factors that is holding back micro businesses from becoming small ones and small ones from becoming medium-sized ones. Half of the population does not have any kind of insurance whatsoever. Not auto insurance, not health insurance, not life insurance, not business insurance, not crop insurance. So in terms of Jamaican society, we see that there is really quite limited access to financial services, as important as financial services are. Why is this? We find that the, the population has a reluctance to use other kinds of payments. And the preference for cash in the absence of the alternatives has to do more with the absence of the alternatives. Why is it more people don't have savings accounts? Our survey revealed that half of the population, half of the low income population actually have savings, but little of it is in a financial account, is in a bank account. It turns out that two out of five persons in our survey said that they lacked proof of address that they would need to be able to access a bank account. When we looked at why there was no access to credit, why people didn't borrow more, what we heard was that borrowing is burdensome in terms of the tediousness and complexity of the process. Two out of five of our respondents said that borrowing was too burdensome and even more so for the low-income population. Specifically in relation to small and medium-sized enterprises, two problems were cited. Inadequate collateral. Micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises don't have the kind of fixed capital that can be used as collateral, the kind of collateral that established commercial banks need. And they have, they have collateral, but not the collateral that banks need. And so that mismatch means that they're not able to access credit. They also spoke about the fact of their informality. Now, of the 425,000 small businesses in Jamaica, 
half of them are informal and therefore lack the capacity to produce the kind of documents that would be required to be able to access credit. The lack of insurance came down to, we were told, the affordability of the premiums. People in, 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 the, in their inability to be able to pay the premiums just had to take the risk. One in three in our survey cited unaffordability as a reason for not having insurance. There was also a problem, by the way, with low levels of financial literacy and a failure to understand the nature of insurance products that were available to them. So we can see that there are proximate causes uh, as we have cited, but what is the real underlying problem? Why is it that such a large segment of the market for financial services even amongst those who have some access to financial services, who may actually have an account but don't have insurance, may have a payment a card, either a debit card or a credit card, but not able to borrow money. Why is it such a large segment of the untapped financial services market remains untapped? The reason for that is that going into the furthest reaches of this market is not especially enticing, not especially profitable to the large established financial institutions. Acquiring customers is costly. Maintaining customers is costly. If this is a low income customer or a customer who is not going to make great use of financial services, then probably the return to be had in terms of profit from that customer is not worth the cost. It may also be not worth the risk when you consider that every new customer presents a risk in terms of being compliant with anti-money laundering requirements and financing terrorism requirements. So segments of the market are not of interest to large commercial banks that have a business based on serving better off customers and customers that are going to make more use of the services. And their systems are not geared to the furthest reaches of the market. And it's not, there's, it's not that there's not been an absence of entrepreneurial interest in this space. You know, startups and new entrants come along every once in a while with new products and haven't been able to make space into the market. And a part of that has to do with the regulatory hurdles required to get registered as the kind of institutions that our regulatory framework are accustomed to dealing with. For one thing, as you might imagine, our regulatory frameworks for financial institutions were not designed when digital existed. And so they didn't contemplate and were drafted with lightweight digital services in mind. What is the solution to this problem? Financial exclusion is a product of our existing architecture and our existing institutions. So therefore, if we are going to have a financial system that is open to new kinds of customers and new kinds of services, it requires a new architecture and new institutions. And that's what brings us to open banking. The term refers formally to the sharing on individuals and businesses with third party providers through a secure platform. Some elements need to be in place for us to be able to have an open banking platform that has the potential to meet the unbanked and those who are only partially in the financial system. First, you need a digital infrastructure. Jamaica has already started to put that digital infrastructure in place. It requires a national digital identification system and our national identification system is on its way to coming into reality. 
the legislation has been passed and now the implementation is on the way. Secondly, it needs digital currency issued by the central bank. In the same way the central bank issues paper money, the central bank needs to issue digital currency known as CBDC. Regulatory progress has already been made in the directions we need to have on open banking. The Data Protection Act was passed in 2020, and last year, the central bank established a fintech regulatory sandbox, which is a, a walled-in regulatory space in which startups can test out their, their new financial products. So a start has been made. What is left to be done? Well, having passed the Data Protection Act, now the regulations that are going to govern that need to be drafted. That's important because those regulations are going to govern, govern the sharing of transactional data, sharing of data on customers and transactions that are going to be conducted under the Act. We also need to draft regulations specifically for the conduct of open banking. Open banking regulations also facilitate data being shareable. Brazil, for example, requires that all registered financial institutions share transactional information with third parties. So that's a model. If we can complete the establishment, the drafting and implementation of these regulations, then we're going to have open platforms and facilitating regulations out of which will come competition and innovation. And it is that competitive innovation that is going to bring new players and new services that are going to seep into every financial service niche. Bringing in the unbanked is not for the existing institutions to reach out to them. It is for the financial sector to be able to reach the unbanked where they are. Not to get the people to do what the banks want to do, and by banks I mean the entire financial sector, but to get the financial sector to meet the people where they are. With an open banking platform, then the reach of financial services will expand to encompass more of the population. That's what we need to do. Damien, as I said, this was a very exciting project to work on that we've been working on for the past year. We are going to start taking questions via Slido. Uh, the instructions are there at the bottom of the screen. Go to the browser, slido.com, uh, code, event code is Capri. And we have one poll up and we're about to put up another one. So please answer that one. The second poll as well. And I can see from the first poll results that most of our audience, at least those who are joining us tonight are quite well banked. The majority of people have four or more accounts, which takes me to the first question I'm gonna put, and I'm gonna put this to Brian Winter. You know, we do research on a lot of topics. Some of them are more uncomfortable than others. And then we do work like this, where we get a lot of support from the stakeholders. Uh, the Bank of Jamaica was so generous with their time and providing us with data. Getting data is not usually that easy for us. And other stakeholders were so willing to provide feedback um, and other support for them. Why is this something that so many people want right now? Why is this such an important topic for the stakeholders that they are so supportive of this effort? Well, th thank you very much, Diana. And um, I must say that's an excellent question. I, I think um, I'd also say first to thank you and the organizers for having me on this panel and for uh, taking up this really important topic. Um, the 
why why is it so of so much interest today? Um, I think it has been of great interest for quite a while. Um, it's just not been called financial inclusion or labeled that, but we see it in the periodic eruptions of um, anger, fury, frustration, hostility that we are now starting uh, with the classic or the, the the recurring decimal of complaints about banks' fees, fees and charges at banks. Um, we see it in uh, a number of the experiences that the the um, Damien's excellent presentation of the report highlighted. That is the true experience of the uh, of the regular Jamaican, most Jamaicans, um, most working Jamaicans have this kind of lack of access um, and they live in a world where they have been to, to, to a larger or lesser degree uh, excluded. And that's actually become, become, I think for many seen as a sort of the normal state of things. I think what has happened, and I, I don't want to put too much credit to it, but I think some credit should be given to the fact that um, in, certainly in Jamaica, that some years ago, it was recognized that this was an issue that needed to be taken from the world of anger, frustration, um, lack of progress, and of course the resulting uh, negative impact on Jamaica's opportunity to to grow and the opportunity for Jamaicans to 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 live the kind of lives to which they 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 should be able to aspire to. Um, and the creation, therefore, it took several years of an initiative to pull together a national financial inclusion strategy. And you mentioned Bank of Jamaica in your comments, Diana, and thank them for the, for the information. But you know, the information that they have shared, they didn't have it until this initiative um, started to say, well, hang on a minute, we need to do something more than what, is, what has been done. And I just want to quickly say here that um, the way that we, uh, the, the way that our institutions are, uh, what kind of institutions we have, tends to define what sort of discussions we have and what and how we address problems. Um, there was no institution for financial inclusion, per se. And as uh, Damien's presentation outlined, financial uh, the, the ways in which you can be excluded cuts across a range of activities. So it's not just one thing. It's not just bank accounts, for example. And so um, I think that the, the effort to pull together a, a network of interested parties under this umbrella of the National Financial Inclusion Strategy has been bearing some success. Um, and I think that it's important, I believe, for this to go further. And, you know, I think today's report, uh, the report being launched today does show how much can be achieved when you build, you give enough of a base of information that uh, mm -hmm. a report as um, reasoned, as deliberate, as reflective as this one um, can be put out by an independent entity grappling with the problem that everybody can see as a problem. Um, and I think that that's an important step. The question mm -hmm. is how to go further. And I have some thoughts about that as we mm -hmm. go forward, if, if, if I have, if that, if I have the opportunity as to where I think we should be looking beyond mm -hmm. the, um, ex the specific proposals that, that we see in the report. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, we, you, you BOJ may have found the data for us, but usually state institutions are not that generous. So we were very appreciative. Arlene, we never intended to talk about bank fees at any point in time when we did this study or thought about the discussion, but right now that's all people are talking about. Yes, and it's interesting that one of the discussions that is being had about the, I think it's the increase in bank fees by some of the commercial yes. banks is that this is going to push people out of the system and that this is the opposite direction of what we are all trying to do, which is bring more people mm -hmm. into the system. What are your thoughts on how this is this current debate is shaping up in the context of trying to broaden financial inclusion? Right. 
Good night, Diana. And I did expect to be asked <laughs> such a question tonight. And let me first of all comment on the, the fact that these are really tough times that we are seeing in, in Jamaica with price increases happening across the various sectors. For the banking sector, I will really allow the JBA to respond formally, but let me just let you know how we at First Global have been approaching um, the financial inclusion. What we want to ensure is continued partnership with our clients. As we navigated through the pandemic, we offered various payment reliefs and restructuring, and we continued to push final financial inclusion, which encouraged more access to banking at lower costs. As such, we continue to expand our community banking model. As you know, we have our agent locations, 15 locations island-wide, and we're expecting to add an additional two in 2022. At these locations, majority of the services there are free versus the usual charges. We also recently upgraded our online banking system, our Global Access Plus, and um, as Dr. King referred to, we see where person's digital banking is what financial, what will help to boost financial inclusion. We want our global access platform is very user-friendly and it is convenient. We remain committed, right? Using our mission every day, which is to empower our customer to get ahead in life and business. So our main focus and we have, what we have done for our customers is to ensure that simplified way of banking. All they would need to open an account is an ID and for businesses the same. So that is how we continue to push our financial inclusion and ensure that at these touch points, our fees are almost most majority of the times free. Okay. All right, well, there you go. Those of you who are complaining about the fees, you can simply switch banks. That's always an option for people. Um, before we go into some of the Slido questions, I wanted to share what we call a box pop, some of the views that we got when we went out on the streets of Kingston and asked people their thoughts about banking and their participation in the formal banking system. Let's take our first clip. No, I don't use the bank. All right, is there a reason why? The bank under capitalist system. Uh -huh. You see, money is an illusion. Money is an instrument. Mm -hmm. So I use the money to purchase these products. Mm -hmm. So this is my investment. Right. Okay. Because when you put the money in the bank, mm -hmm. the bank lend it out and mm -hmm. make investment. Mm -hmm. So I use this as, your investment. as my capital investment. Okay. Okay, to generate more profit. So if I have one spirulina, mm -hmm. I use the money and multiply it and get 500 spirulina. Right. And as the, and the, and the list goes down from 500 to a million, so I use my money to multiply. All right. Yeah? yeah. Multiply my business. I don't really generally use the bank. No, I don't. So, Brian, I wanted to give the opportunity here to maybe refer to some of the remarks that he made and talk a bit about what you had said earlier that about some of the ideas you have to how we can move this forward, bearing in mind that those kinds of views and perspectives are not uncommon. Uh, well, I thought his views were, I mean, but for the label that he was using, he sounded like, and I hope he is and will be, a very successful capitalist. He described what you should do. There's just, I mean, I think that young man has a very good understanding of what he should do. Now, the question that we are facing is how, you know, forget the labels for a minute. Mm -hmm. There are financial services that can allow him to perform better for his life, his family, and make better investments. Why does he not know about them? Why does he not understand them? Or let me assume that he does know because he seems quite um, 
you know, a very aware young man. Um, so why does he why uh, why does he not see them as for him? And okay. I think this does connect to the fees and charges um, arguments. Okay, and I, I'm not trying to provoke, but I believe that what a lot of this is about is about the appropriateness of the services for us for the for this young man and for anybody else. Um, there's a reason I think Damien touched on it in his presentation why cash is why is there, there's a preference for cash. You know, I don't like that term, a preference for cash. It seems to me that people um, are using the, the financial product that, that best works for them. Um, so the, the real question is, why are there not better financial services for these individuals provided by financial service providers? So I, I think there's an opportunity that has come about because of the um, the financial technology um, developments over the, uh, and the information technology developments that um, let's you know take give a nod to the government for establishing or moving towards NIDS because that quite correctly is a is an important underpinning for for being able to use these products on a wider scale um, but you know it's about knowledge and understanding that's really what's maybe one of our bigger obstacles. I um, bank at a particular financial institution. I have not been in a branch of that bank. I think, I don't know if I ever have been in a proper branch of that bank ever. Everything I do is online uh, through the various mechanisms that they have, the online banking, the uh, mobile banking. Um, I pay a, a, a particular individual who does uh, gardening services and other services like that for me. And I pay him cash regularly. And it took, you know, for years and I didn't understand. It took me a long time before I kind of asked him, well, you know, do you have a bank account? He said, yeah, his bank, he banks at the same bank I bank at. I said, oh, um, so maybe I could pay you through your phone. He says he doesn't really want to do that, partly because he needs to go and pay the, the JPS. Um, so he, I give him cash, and then he goes to JPS to pay his utility bill. Um, this guy, this young, this gentleman, he's not a young man. He's he's a individual who's built a family. It's very responsible. Um, it's the backbone of Jamaica, in my opinion. People like him. Um, but there he is, riding his bicycle every month to go to JPS to pay his phone bill. Um, his his power, his light light bill. Um, I said, but isn't that, doesn't that a bit of a hassle? He says, no, he goes early, so it's not that much of a line. So he takes a, an hour, or maybe, an, I don't know how long exactly, but he's quite okay with what he does. And I sit, I sit in my, right here in this room, and I pay it on my phone, you know, or while I'm waiting to, uh, you know, to, I'm, I'm doing something in my day-to-day -day life, I pay my light bill using my phone. Turns out, when I, when I discuss this with him, he has the same app, he can you he, he can do the same thing I do. He's not excluded, right. um, but he's not using the service. He doesn't really. It's not been presented to him. Maybe I, I don't know all the reasons. And he's as I said, I'm using this as an example of somebody like the young man that we looked at. You know, intelligent, aware, engaged, involved, but yet not using the services. There's a problem there to do with I think the interest of the. Um, institutions in having these people use their services, something Damien touched on. So I think that the new products, the new services, the competitive enti com the, the, the competing entities um, like Arlene's, um, who are coming up with things that suit the, us, our, our people better at lower costs. Um, so we have to expose people to more competition. Um, and I think that is where we're going to find a way with new products that are more fine-tuned or tailored to what people need. Okay, thank you. I'm going to just pick up on that. And you know, I'm looking at the questions coming in on Slido, and uh, there are quite a few. Thank you for putting the questions in. Uh, parse some of the sentiments that are coming from the questions and ask Monique to talk a little bit about the underbanked. So I think that was exactly who Brian was referring to is, you know, this gentleman, has an account at his own bank, he has the app, he knows that these things exist, 
but and there are many people liking because I think the number of underbanked was quite high. If you just speak a bit to what the study found about the underbanked. Thank you for that question. All right, so um, we found that, as Damon would have mentioned in the in the presentation, among those who are employed, half of them about half of them have bank accounts, but do not receive cash through it. And two of the reasons that I would like to highlight, and I think I'd like to um, highlight them, I think they're very important. One is the high level of um, distrust among the population, both um, regarding financial institutions and the government, and, uh, um, and also financial literacy. Now, when people don't trust the government or the formal banking sector, it does affect how they use um, the services. And um, that is one of the reasons why we are pushing for this whole open banking platform, because what it does, as Brian mentioned, is that it would have increased the level of competition um, within the financial ecosystem, um, forcing uh, basically, well, opening up the ecosystem so that um, those who are underbanked, they can now engage in other institutions, those that are more trustworthy in their um, eyes, and of course that would be the private sector, um, or third, third party financial services. Um, financial literacy also affects them, their usage of these platforms, and you know, one of those under that is the fact that many of them don't understand how to use it. Many of them don't understand the importance, as you can see in the video, the importance of having financial um, functionalities such as public credit, access to credit, access to um, insurance and other services would have been investment or pension, so to speak. Um, we found that a lot of them, about half of them, don't have that level of understanding. And this is also particular among the youth, right? So many youth believe that, you know, insurance is not for them, right? They probably don't need it now or they don't, you know, it's for old people. But the truth is insurance spreads across all age cohorts. And I do believe that once they get the understanding that this is in case of in case something an emergency happens, a shock to your income, you know, health reasons, etc. These are important services that you as a young person would need. Don't wait until that point in time to get it. So financial literacy um, and trust in the formal banking system is one is two. Well, are two of the you know major reasons why we find that the those who are banked, they're not using the services as much as we would like them to. Which I think really brings to life what Monique was just talking about. I get the, um, the 10,000 package. You get a 10,000 dollars compensation. Package. Okay, and how was accessing that? How did you, how was getting that? Um, my daughter go up on the internet, pick up the information, send it off, and then give you time when... But I'm telling you, it was like a carnival, like a Christmas to get in at the line to get food. And when you go to the post office, people push you till you're tired, you have to come out tired. You know why I access it? It's like one man the way up on top and he calm me saying get a message to see me. And he just ease out and put me in there. So it was, it was long line? Long line, days and days and days and days. The people collect it before. Thanks. That actually wasn't the clip that I had asked for. But um, the point is, and this is to you, Arlene, these issues of lack of trust and lack of financial literacy, how are you in the private banking world, those of you who want to expand your market, how are you dealing with these issues? Because I imagine that these would be some of the challenges you face in getting and keeping customers. Um, most definitely. And when I listen to that, that young, that um, customer now, just now, what you mentioned is something that we were in the midst of it. We started our simplified savings account 
during that process. Mm -hmm. And um, when persons were collecting that 10,000 and got an overwhelming subscription of about 7,000 accounts, we were able to open for customers to access their funds to their bank account. And what Monique has spoken of, the financial literacy is definitely the key to the changes that we want to see for growth in the financial inclusion space. Um, the, this, for 2022, our GK, our financial group, there is a thrust for us, and we will be having several financial literacy programs going out into the communities. As Dr. King says, we have to go out and meet with persons, understand what they're, what is happening with them, to build back that that thrust, trust, sorry, money spoke up right earlier. And, and, and provide a simpler way, continuously change our way of banking, making it much simpler for persons not only to access savings account, because it's beyond only savings account now persons are requesting in this space. You saw where the young man spoke earlier on of capital, selling his thing and building his capital. They want to borrow. They want to get access to loans. They want to improve their standard of living. They want to purchase lands, motor vehicles. They want to get ahead in life and businesses. So they want, so with that, and we cannot, we have to change how we, we approach them. We cannot come with complex, complex things and um, loans and so on. We have to come very simple in, in this space. And this is something our financial group we have the micro insurance too. They are also making it as simple as possible to ensure persons buying to these products and services we have to offer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, we are going to play the other clip now, which I think is an important one that again brings some of these issues to the to the surface. All right, so you were saying that you don't um, save with the bank, right? No. All right, you can tell me the reason why. Uh, I get the one. Too much information. They want too much information? Yeah, too like much. they require too much documents yeah, to yeah, too much documents. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, you know one reason I wanted to play that because it brings, you know, as short as the clip is, it brings to you know to the fore many of the issues that we found in this study, the as you said, the lack of documentation. And we looked at it more in a practical sense of people not having the documents, but his, um, his energy was more about that he doesn't want to give the information, whether he has the documents or not. And so the question that follows from that is, how are we going to manage these kinds of attitudes as we seek to elevate some of the products that are being offered? So the central bank digital currency, um, this idea that we have put forward of this open platform when there is still some resistance to some of the very uh, initial steps to becoming bank. Brana, if you could give some, some thought to, you know, how, how are we expecting Jamaicans to become comfortable with something like a digital currency yeah. when there's a low lo level of financial literacy, there's lack of trust, and there's also resistance to do the most basic thing, which is to give information to a financial institution. Well, I think the, the literacy issue and numeracy issues are really very serious. I think there is a real problem we face if we want to expand access to products and services that, um, that require, if we are, if we are to really um, open up all these products to the population, they require a level of literacy and numeracy if, if for these, for, for these um, people to understand how they're, you know, what services are being offered and, and make sure they don't get um, um, misled or misunderstand or even cheated. Um, so I think that's a deep problem that we need to not only look at financial literacy, which is something that I, I was very happy to hear Arlene mentioned the efforts of, um, of First Global, and those should be commended of the whole financial sector, but much more needs to be done. But I think beyond that, we have to sort of find a way for everybody to focus on in a way that we tend to just give lip service to it, I think, um, to, to general education, because in a sense, you know, you can't get very far if you 
can't reach a certain basic level of numeracy and literacy. So that's a serious issue that's for the society at large that we need to recognize. I think in terms of um, the approach though, I, I, I personally, well, I've come to believe after, over, after quite a bit of time and some reflection that we really have to much, focus much more seriously on competition and increasing uh, competitive behavior and the and the provision the competitive provision of services from different sources um, I think the open banking idea and I'd like us to broaden the concept that we're thinking of of open banking mm -hmm. it's not about your data being shared only but it's about you being able to have your service provider that you choose plug into the bank and uh, get get information out of it and do transactions I mean I I, I just want to make that point there that that's one important policy step that I think I'm glad that you put it on the table there and I do think that should be advanced with some urgency because it will it will open up competition in a landscape that Jamaicans have not seen that said there are some uh, investments that you're seeing by uh, institutions um, uh, it, it, I mentioned the fintech space in particular um, I'm associated with it with a with a uh, a product, a new product that's out there. I don't know if I'm allowed to advertise, so I'll try and be a little bit careful. <laughs> um, but maybe I can. But um, but you know, your 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 phrase uh, "check in" in the title is quite cute and quite clever. Um, but I would have to say, um, sort of outdated in a way, because mm -hmm. you know we don't check in anymore, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we don't even check out. Mm -hmm. What we do is we sign in, and this new product that I'm talking about. You can sign up. It should only take you five minutes. You only need a TRN and you need an, a Jamaican ID. You don't need anything else. And you can sign in in five minutes and anyone can sign in. And what we do and what we have is we cash in and we cash out. But most importantly, we transact with each other. So you mentioned CBDC. I think that's a very important initiative and, and I, I, I applaud it. But private... Um, Payments, electronic wallets, mobile wallets exist already. The one I'm mentioning is a new competitor in that space. Um, and I think these, are, these can offer basic payment services quickly to everybody. And that's already starting to happen. Um, and they will graduate to, to different sort of services through that, through, through that mechanism. This becomes a major competitor to income streams that banks currently or have been monopolizing, um, banks are investing in those areas. Um, so I think by opening up competition, we change that landscape and we stop worrying about whether people trust bank A or bank B or the banks, because there's a service being provided that satisfies that person, that individual, okay? Um, what we then have to do if we're doing this, we have to much more seriously, um, I think, turn our attention to consumer protection. Quite a bit has been done in the last few years, but I believe nothing like as much as is needed because we need a consumer protection environment. And that's not just one thing. It's a bit complex, I think, but you know you have consumer protection when you, you, you know it when you, when you feel it. And in Jamaicans, the ones who lack trust and that's pervasive, they don't feel that this is an environment that protects them. It doesn't look after them. It's not easy for them to get um, to get um, solutions or resolutions. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of work being done to improve that, but I think we have to take much, much stronger steps on the consumer protection side, even as we take much stronger steps to transform the competitive landscape, even more than it is today. Um, and those two things, I think, will resolve that trust issue that we're talking about, because we will stop talking about whether you trust the banks mm -hmm. You know, who cares if you're mm -hmm. able to pay and receive and get loans, get insurance? You don't really. You can hear the debate about banks, but you're not. You're not sure. It's like a remote debate because you're not paying any fees and charges. Um, the product I mentioned, there's just zero cost to transferring money, and this is not the only one, as I said. So, um, I think there are answers there. But I just make one last point before I, I, I stop to say that. The, the report paid quite a lot of attention to um, 
credit to SMEs and others. And that's an important topic that we haven't dwelled on today, but it's, it, I think it's really significant. I just want to say that we need to do something more than just come up with these, these proposals. I'm not criticizing the report. I'm trying to urge that we raise our ambition to address creditor rights more seriously with the aim of significantly expanding the supply of credit. And when more people want to lend, you, the consumer has a more competitive environment and can get better terms. Um, so I just want to add that as well to your menu of things that I think should be done. Oh, well, actually, you answered my wrap-up question already, so I'm going to go straight to Arlene to ask her, you know, just as a last thing to say, if there was anything that you think we should have talked about or anything you want to make sure is included in this discussion, which we will be continuing beyond this, this uh, panel discussion here, and which we hope will continue beyond Capri. Um, we hope that this will be the start of a broader conversation in the public. Is there anything else that we need to be thinking about as we have this discussion? Right. So, um, Brian just touched on it more for me. Um, the micro, small, and medium-sized businesses. These are the ones we want to capture more, given that they will impact economic economic growth in the, in Jamaica. So the focus around the financial literacy and so on should also include these type of businesses. And I, I think that young man really um, confirmed that this is a way to really push financial literacy, not only for individuals, but for small businesses also. Okay, thanks. And Monique, as the lead researcher on this report that we're so proud of, what's the one thing that we haven't said tonight that you want to put out there? Um, I think for the most part, I mean, Brian did a good job a while ago just to cover the majority of what wasn't said. But I would just like to emphasize that the reason the report focused um, so much on regulatory environment is because it is critical in expanding financial inclusion. As you said, if persons don't trust the system, if there aren't um, legislations in place to protect the consumer, to protect um, the lenders, the financial institutions, then there, there's, there are going to be frictions in the market. And so, you know, um, we focused on consumer protection. Also for MSMEs, we looked at um, the importance of expanding the microfinance and microinsurance sector, because that is targeted at low income um, individuals who the report um, found are those who um, were disproportionately affected um, by financial exclusion. So, you know, yeah, I think this has been a good discussion and, you know, thank you once again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. The, there are a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to. We're never able to cover everything in an hour and especially when we have a topic like this, there's a lot to be said. We will be having an IG Live with Damien and Leanne Levers, our Director of Advocacy, where we, we do store the questions, all of them, and we will get to those. So please look out on our social media for the time for that IG Live on Monday. Remember to answer the second poll question, which I think actually follows really nicely on what Brian just said about not even needing a bank, which is, would you be willing to have an account with a business that is not a bank? Not saying that his, what he's doing is not a bank, but that if that's the model going forward, then is that something that you would be willing to do with your own money? For example, a business that offers a prepaid debit card. With that, I want to thank our panelists so much for a really rich discussion. And thank you to Damien for the presenting. And I'm going to hand back over to Nicole, who's going to send us home.